There might be fewer players, but there's never a lack of exciting action. This is the statewide Idaho 8-Man PrepCast with Brandon Bainey and Paul Kingsbury. That's right. It's another edition of the Idaho 8-Man PrepCast here on IdahoSports.com. Uh, as you just heard in the intro, Brandon Bainey with Paul Kingsbury. Uh, Post-Labor Day weekend, Paul, did you have a nice uh, long holiday weekend? It was a long holiday weekend, yes. Whether it was good or not, no, we'll see. We'll see it's how always, it is. it's always a good time when Kingsbury's in the house, right? Yeah, it's something. It's something. I, I'm not wearing white because that's just a faux, faux pas after Labor Day, but I, I am doing well. How about you? How was your uh, Labor Day? Well, I'm wearing white, so I guess that answers mm. the question. So, yeah, well, a friendly reminder if you want to see what we're wearing, we post a video uh, of this uh, podcast uh, each and every week to the IdahoSports.com YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook page, or you can get the audio only at idahosports.com or wherever you download your podcasts. Well, I was trying to set it up that it's always a a fun time with Kingsbury, but we're going to have a lot of fun today, Paul, because we've got uh, a guest coming on the program today. We do, and he's a very special guest, um, as as they say in the biz. He's a guy that's been around a very long time. I first met him on the sidelines at Homedale High School back before we even were broadcasting here at idahosports.com. I was there taking pictures um, for action photo galleries, uh, and he had a great big, you know, twenty thousand dollar camera on his shoulder. He was uh, the weekend sports guy at uh, KIVI Channel Six uh, here in the Treasure Valley, um, and we just grew into being really great friends. And he's a uh, he, he's what you could call a an eight man football expert. So it's it's really cool to have him here today. Yeah, let's bring him into the program. Will Henneke, welcome in. Will, how hey, are you? Thanks for having me. I appreciate the. Uh... Uh, the tabulation as an expert, I'd stop short of saying I'm an expert, but I, maybe I fake it better than some people. Well, when you're, when you're sitting next to Paul and I, it's not difficult to be an expert in the field. So you look great in comparison. I always liked standing next to him because I'm about six foot two. He's about five foot two, you know, made me feel better about myself. Yeah. (laughs) I could say why I feel better about standing next to you, but we won't go into that. (laughs) Well, I don't have a cool trucker hat like you do. So that makes you a little bit better. That's true. True. Yeah. And again, if you want to see Paul's trucker hat, just check out the video on our YouTube channel or the uh, Facebook page, idahosports.com. Will, you you are a connoisseur of the eight-man football game. And so we kind of wanted to give you the open slate. We had had a lot of uh, interesting scores. There there weren't a ton of close games like like we saw in week one, but there was definitely some some action that stood out. And we kind of wanted to pick over a couple of games. Was there anything in particular that really jumped out to you? You know, there were a couple of games that uh, when you look at them, they they, they got to catch your attention a little bit. One was, uh, you know, Kerry defeating North Gem. And it's not that Kerry won. Um, you know, that's kind of being like being surprised that Alabama won on a, on a Saturday in college football. But, um, you know, they didn't exactly run over North Gem, you know, with a bulldozer. It was a, it was a fairly competitive game. Uh, I've been on the, the train all along, and Brandon, I know you have as well, that North Gem's a chance that has a chance to compete when we get into to state tournament time, playoff time. In fact, I mean, I'll go on the record and say I think either them or Rockland will be playing in the state semifinals at the 1A Division II classification level. We'll see who it is. So North Gem to go up against Cary. And remember, one week earlier, Cary absolutely demoed a, a decent Garden Valley team. You know, just went to yeah. Garden Valley and just absolutely – ran over him with a train. Um, so for North Gem to go in there and be able to move, be able to put up some points, be able to to kind of stay within touch, I think that was pretty impressive. And then uh, the other one, I think, when when you talk about Horseshoe Bend, Wilder, uh, Horseshoe Bend punching up a level from D2 up to D1, I don't think we knew a lot about Wilder coming in. Um, you know, Diego Rodriguez gone. Uh, Cody Walker gone. They lost a lot of pretty good players. And Kyle Dalsolio is a heck of a coach, and he's done a good job with that program. And and Horseshoe Bend won the game. That's another team that I could see playing in the Division II semifinals. But for Wilder, kind of an unknown quantity, some younger players, you're moving some new guys into bigger roles. For them to compete pretty well, you know, toe-to-toe with a good Horseshoe Bend team, I think was impressive. Yeah, uh, that carry game, 54-34. The Panthers did win by 20, but like you said, not a lot of teams are putting 30-plus points up on carry, so that that did raise some eyebrows. I would say for North Gem, the, the one key that 
I think they got to get figured out is maybe finding a little more balance. We know that they have Bridger Hatch at quarterback, and he's a tremendous rusher. He rushed for over 300 yards in the win, but he only attempted one pass. He was 0 for 1 passing, and that's it. And that, like, there, there has to be a little bit more of a passing game just to keep defenses honest, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I think I think so because I think you get into a position when you're playing, you know, a carry, a horseshoe bend, an insert team here, you know, Mullen St. Regis, let's bring them into the mix, or Kendrick, you're gonna have to be able to, you know, potentially make up points in a hurry, which you can do in the eight man game because it's the same field with you know six less players between the two teams. But, you know, if, if someone gets up on North Gem, a touchdown, two touchdowns early, you're going to have to be able to make up some of those points. And, yeah, Bridger Hatch, I think he's one of the best D2 players in the state, period. Um, but at some point, they're going to need something from somebody else. And it's almost like if you merged them and Rockland, because uh, Rockland, they like to throw the ball. And they have some yeah. big, really good wide receivers. If you put the two of them together – um, I'm guessing they don't like each other a whole lot being from the same district, the same conference and all that stuff, but, um, that'd be a heck of a football team. And it's like both teams, if they, if they can find a way to do the other, just a little bit better, they're, they're legit, they're legit contenders. You know, and, and one thing in the, the eight man ranks, especially, and I think the eight man ranks are more forgiving than, than the 11 man with having that special player, especially at quarterback, who essentially is the running back. You know, they hike the ball to him, and it's a, it's a wildcat to the quarterback, essentially, because you know he's going to run 80% of the time, maybe 90%, and then throw once in a while. Um, and, and that works. You know, you look back at, at Salmon River when Van Der Esch was there. He was the quarterback, and he was a running quarterback. He was a big, strong kid, and so you would just expected him to run. Hatch, you expect him to run. And, and that works to a point um, a, a lot of times in, in eight-man until you get to the end of the game, until you get to the end of the season. And then it's that kid who has, you know, shouldered the bulk of the plays all year long. He's gotten hit, you know, he's gotten, you know, little injuries that, that normally don't, don't matter, but they add up, you know, you get a little thigh bruise here, you get a little stinger on your arm here. Those add up when you get down into the postseason. So unless you've got those, those other players that can step up and, and fill some roles, it, it makes it really tough to go deep um, in, in the playoffs in November, but, regular season even early um you know early november and october you get these teams that have that one two special players and and the whole team is on their back and like i said the eight man ranks seem to be a little more forgiving with that um you know whether it's a lack of players just the way the game's played i don't know but you see these teams historically you know will you've seen these up and down for 20 years the kids or the, the teams that have those one or two really special players tend to be the teams that are perennial um you know great teams and going to the playoffs and winning state championships for whatever reason and you're and, right and, you know you're right paul that team that has that one big pony yeah that that can buoy them to the top quite a bit but the flip side of that coin um you know we just got done with the the idahosports.com football previews there are what 45 eight-man teams in the state of idaho yeah. and i guarantee you 45 coaches if you ask them what's your x factor it's health um, yep. And you take a team like let's let's use North Gem just as an example. Um, what happens if Bridger Hatch gets hurt? Uh, let's go up to Water Springs if Drew Plucker gets hurt. What happens yeah. there? Um, R.J. Phyllis at, at Chalice if he gets hurt. What happens there? You know you you've got to have that yep. second pony somewhere. And I think yeah. a lot of times that that's what differentiates. And I think that. For Mullen St. Regis, for example, that's what makes them so dangerous. You have Adam Ball and Luke yeah. Trogdon and Caleb Ball. If one of them yeah. is off, if one of them is shut down, you got two other guys that can potentially go make plays. And with Kendrick, yep. uh, Ty Kep, the 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 Hewitts, you you've got multiple yep. players that can hit that home run. Oh, absolutely, and 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 you see that with the the, the teams that we've you know last year. Um, you've got the Powers. Uh, for Dietrich, Connor Simpson, um, there at Cary, and they they've got those, you know, like you said, the horses um, coming up behind. But I, I won't say what team this was, but it was I think it was three years ago, and I I traveled to watch this this eight man game, and the quarterback got hurt, and the backup quarterback was this freshman five two maybe. I mean this kid 
comes out, they didn't have a, a uniform small enough for him. You know, the, the helmet is rattling around two sides and, and he's out there playing quarterback um, against this team that didn't care that he was a freshman and, and half their size. So when, when your number twos are, are so far behind your number ones, it makes it really hard. And, and, you know, we always joke about, well, as long as you stay healthy, we joke about kids saying that, but especially in eight man, that, that line is, is very, very true week in and week out. You know, you, you wonder, you know, Castle Ford is a team that's gotten off to a good start at 2-0. and Are they good enough to withstand Eric Taylor getting injured? He's a heck of yeah. a player. He's a yeah. really good player. I don't think people know a lot about him, um, but he's a really good player. However, if he sprains an ankle, you know, if something like that, and, you know, knock on wood, we don't want to see it happen. But if it right. does, how does that change the Castle Ford narrative? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Castle Ford, uh, a 2 0 start to the season. They're looking very strong. They beat Water Springs 58 to 20. You mentioned Mullen St. Regis, Will. And I know if you just look at the score, they played Thompson Falls High School from Montana and they lost 44 to 26. But for some comparison, that is an eight man program, obviously, but it is one of the largest. In fact, they typically fluctuate between 11 man and eight man football. So it's one of the biggest eight man programs in Montana playing a Mullen St. Regis team. That's obviously very small. So I don't think you can glean much from that result. And then uh, Paul, you mentioned salmon river. I, I did want to give a special nod to this. Um, salmon river is a program that, you know, we were hearing, were they going to have enough players for a team this year? They did get enough and, and were able to put a schedule together. They played Meadows Valley, and that was the first game for the Mountaineers in a really long time. And they won 60 to nothing, which I don't think was yeah. too surprising. Will, this Meadows Valley story is something you've been following very closely. How awesome is it that a school that hasn't had football in, in years is able to, to put together a varsity team again? Yeah, anytime a, a school is is able to get back on the football field, you know, Greenleaf Friends, Kootenays playing again this year, yeah. I think those stories have to be celebrated. I'm all about opportunities for kids. And uh, I've talked to Jared McIlvain, the head coach up at Meadows Valley, a couple times, and he said, the downside is they have a few players that aren't eligible yet. They don't have enough practices and whatnot. So they only had nine players on the field um, uh, able to play on, on Friday. But he said the upside is we made some plays. You know, we had a, I think he said they had one or two touchdowns called back on penalties. They had a couple long runs. They had a few sacks. And, and this, is a, this is a program, you think about it, some of these really small communities, and Paul, I know you drive through New Meadows all the time. Yep. It is a small community. Yeah. A lot of these kids are literally learning how to play football at the varsity level yeah. against, you know, Salmon River. They play Lewis County coming up a little bit later. I think they're playing, I want to say council. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't Probably. have their schedule yeah. in front of me. You know, that's, you want to talk about learning by fire. You're going up against kids that have been playing for, four, five, six years, and you're just trying to remember where to line up on each snap. So right. it's going to be, for, for Meadows Valley, it's going to be, you, you, this isn't a season you measure in wins and losses. You measure in, you know, where were we on day one? And where did we get to by the end of the season? And then you produce, you procured into next season. Right. And then that's when you're like, okay, now all of our kids have played, all of our kids have seen through it the you know the the game's moving a little bit slower uh that's when you can start to, i think really start to judge what's going on up there i think that's really great perspective by coach McIlvain up there to not okay we, we've got a season and we've got to come out and win a state championship guys come on let's 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 make this a storybook ending they're gonna make a movie about us instead he's he's saying you know almost in games that we've broadcast and by the fourth quarter you know, it's a 40, 40 point difference. And so we always say, well, you're just, you're looking for little things. You're looking for positives. You're, you're, you're looking for good plays. And that's what, that's what their season is about. You know, Hey guys, we got that long run. How did we get it? You know, what did the blockers do? Right. What did you as a running back do? Right. And so you pick and choose and then you're really teaching them how to play football from their successes and their mistakes and pointing them out and saying, here's what we did right. Here's what we did wrong. All right, let's move on to the next game. And that's how you build a program. And hopefully they can sustain numbers so that in the next year, two, three years, you get these kids that are throwing the football on the sideline and, and in the end zone, not even watching the game. But, you know, these varsity kids are heroes and they want to play football. And, and that's where the, the, the program building comes is getting those younger kids. And sometimes it takes three, four, five years, maybe six uh, to really see success build in a program like this. But it takes these guys early on to really take the bumps and the bruises for the, for the program down the road. Yeah, totally agree. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the enthusiasm that's coming out of uh, the Meadows Valley program and Coach yeah. McElvain. Uh, you know, when we do our IdahoSports.com season previews, we we send out uh, basically kind of a preseason questionnaire to every coach asking, hey, who are some key players you have back? Are there any newcomers? You know, what are strengths? What are weaknesses? Because we can we can try to make guesses and speculate based on how they did last year, but we we don't know about the kids that decided to – pursue another activity quit you know quit football we don't know about the players that moved away the players that moved in so we really yeah. rely on the coaches and, and we got a ton of info back from coach McElvain and you could tell that he was really enthusiastic to talk about his team on the flip side of that and it's not just an eight-man problem I, I we no. have this problem all the way up to 5a but there are our coaches that are reluctant to give any information out about their teams especially in the preseason portion because they feel like it gives them an advantage quote unquote to have mystery surrounding their team. And I just, I don't know. I, on one hand, I kind of understand it, but, but at the other time, will I, I feel like you're only hurting your players and your fans and your program. If you're doing that. Yeah. I think there are coaches out there that understandably want to be understandably, I should say, they want to be protective of the proprietary information. Um, you know, and, and, and that's fine. If you don't want people to know that you're, switching from a spread formation to a veer formation. But, um, you know, there are times out there when when um, media, not just us, media anywhere, you know, this, for a lot of these kids, especially when we start getting down into the three A's, the two A's and the one A's, this is their one chance to be front and center. Um, and, you know, protecting that, you know, you're protecting the program as a head coach, but are you really doing right by your kids? Are you, are you giving your kids a chance to shine the way that they deserve to shine? And that's a question for, for coaches and for administrators to answer, not for me. But, you know, I want to know more about these kids. And it's not because I want to know what their time in the 40 is. You know, I want to know, um, you know, here's a kid who does, you know, he's up at four in the morning feeding the cows goes to school all day and then goes to football practice and is, is leading the, the team in, in tackles. You know, those are the stories that I'm interested in. And if, if coaches, you know, if, if they choose to kind of shield outsiders, if you will, for fear of, um, you know, rival X or team Y figuring out, oh man, they got, you know, these two big guys, whatever it is, um, it is, maybe protecting a potential win worth that? And that's that's a question to be asked. I would just, I would like to see coaches, and, and to be clear, 90% of them are great. Um, 90% of them, they can't tell you loud enough or often enough about their, you know, their, their backup guards or their freshman linebacker who literally just started playing football. But uh, there are a few programs out there, and I think, you know, the media who watches this, they're all going to be able to identify schools in yeah. their district at any classification, at any level. Um, they just, they're they're reluctant to share information, and uh, I would just like to see them consider, okay, when, when this young man graduates, am I going to basically have cost him two, three years of being in the spotlight, spotlight that he is probably never going to get again? Um, an opportunity to shine, an opportunity to get recognized, an opportunity to have his story shared. Um, are, are we costing that? And at, at what cost? Yeah. Um, I think it's a conversation to be had. And ultimately, the, you know, the schools and the coaches and the administrators make up their own minds. You know, and I'm going to chime in here as the, the old guy. I mean, I've been, you know, from the old timers perspective, I've been seeing this since, you know, idosports.com started um, and back in the day when it was very basic schedule scores uh, and we tried to do rosters and stats that's really all Idaho sports was back you know before the turn of the century and and we had you know coaches God, that, that makes you sound so old right? before oh, the turn of the century I haven't died it yet this week so it's great uh, but you, you look at these and uh, that how you know as broadcasters we will always reach out to the coaches during game week and say, hey, can you give us a little info on your program? You know, can I get a roster stats? You know, for the the team and individual. And how many times have we gotten? You know what? We don't keep stats. This is a team game. Or I've I've actually gotten in the last two years, for the first time, 
uh, we're not going to give you a roster. What? You know, uh, what? I, I don't get it. And, and but and here's my turn on this is historically, since we have that perspective, we've been doing this for so long. The teams that that welcome us in, that that love the coverage we give them, you know, and, and since this is the eight man prep cast, you look at Coach Hasselstrom. Right. Uh, you know, you look at Coach Bafis when he was at Troy. Um, you, you look at these coaches um, from Dietrich and you look at them for, from all these places and Garden Valley that love us coming. Right. They, they love us coming to give exposure to their kids, their program, their school. They want us there. What do you need? Those are successful programs. And the teams I have found that hold things so close to the vest and don't want to fill out that preview form, don't want to you know return the information, don't want to help their you know, help us cover their kids. They're actually programs that don't have a lot of success. Uh, and, and do they? Is is there a reason? I don't know. But you know, you, stats don't lie. And and me looking back over the course of of history here, twenty plus years, yeah, the, the teams that really like having coverage from the media. It doesn't have to be us. You know, they love the TVs there. They love newspaper guys there, radio. The ones that don't, they're, they're never, hardly ever the, the successful programs. I mean, and I, I could name a few, but I won't. But it's just like, like you said, it's frustrating to see coaches not give their kids uh, props, as the kids say. Why, why not? You know, why not? give exposure and, and put a spotlight on these kids who, like you said, are up in the morning, feeding cows, changing pipes, doing whatever they need to do to help the family, you know, whatever. And they're working their butts off day in and day out. But you know what? I'm not going to fill this form out because it might, uh, it might cost us a game. No, it's not. You know, th th this is Idaho sports. Okay. Th this isn't college blue chips here. This is, it's, you know, don't, don't, I don't know. Don't get too big for your britches, I guess, uh, when, when you're when you're a coach with these programs, you know, help the media cover you, help the media cover your kids and your school and your program. That's what it's all about. At the end of the day, you know, we're not here to to, you know, help other coaches scout you. We're here to possibly get a kid a scholarship. And when when, when coaches say we don't we don't keep stats, really. So when a coach comes and says, you know what, little Bobby there. We'd really like him to, well, we want to give him a scholarship to come play. Can we have any stats? No, sorry, we didn't keep stats. Really? You know, you're either you're either a bad coach or you're lying to me. I'm not sure which it is. Hopefully well, you're lying and the kid actually has stats. Well, so, and none of us are, none of us are blind. None of us are ignorant. We see the two or three kids yeah. down on the sideline for every team taking stats. So yes, to, to your point, Paul, we, we know you got them. If you don't want to share them, that's your choice. As a coach, totally your choice. Um, I just don't want to see a kid get shortchanged an opportunity for his moment. You know, right? Eminem sang about it, right? You know, don't miss your chance to blow. If a kid runs for four hundred yards, tell the world, man. Yeah. Tell the world. Let everybody know my kid just ran for four hundred yards. That yep. could be his moment. Like you said, Paul. Maybe there's a, you know, maybe there's a coach on Twitter who notices a tweet from Idaho Sports about. Man, yeah. that kid it's just happened. ran for nine touchdowns. Maybe yeah. I need to take a look. And yep, you know, you, you have a lot of college programs following you on Twitter, mm -hmm. and and when you tweet something, there's some weight behind it, and and to not be able to do that kills me. And as a from a broadcaster standpoint, when we get a lot of information from Team One and Team Two is that that team that no, we don't have stats, we're not giving you anything. Well, it sounds like we're totally homering that that other team, but it's just because we have more information. I mean, I got. I did a championship game for for the eight man ranks uh, three a few years ago, three four years ago, and I just happened to be at somebody's house, and uh, and the lady found out that I worked for Idaho Sports, and you need to talk to the broadcaster that did that championship game because all he did was talk about this team, and he didn't talk about our team at all. And I I stopped. I said that was actually me. I did that game, and her face just went oh crap, and and I said it's because. I got all this information from this coach mm -hmm. and this coach gave us nothing. And, and so what am I supposed to do? You know, we talked about as much as we could, but if we don't have info, we can't talk about them. And, and, and we can always glean the, the fluff stuff. You know, this is where they're from. This is what the record is, what they've done. But, you know, you get into the stories about the kids that some coaches give us, you know, that here's this kid's nickname. Here's a great story about his family. Here's where, you know, adversity he's overcome. When we're talking about that stuff, 
that's great. That, that's what we want to do. And, uh, and so it, it's just, I laughed. I laughed when it was, you know, he just homered the other team. It, it sounds like it, but it's not really our fault. And as broadcasters, we you know, we've all run into that, you know, a hundred times and we're going to run into it a hundred more times because, you know, coaches that coaches that do it are going to, you know, watch or listen to this and think we're idiots and they're just going to keep doing it anyway. I'm not sure we're going to change anybody's mind, but I feel better unloading that because that's, that's that was 20 years of pent up anger that i just got out in about five minutes so i appreciate that brandon very nice Thanks. yeah yeah i'll uh, charge you guys for the therapy bill later that'll be uh, <laughs> i appreciate it <laughs> 60 dollars a minute and we've been going for about mm, 25 minutes now so time to go <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. well let's let's transition I, I thought that was a really good conversation and again this is the Idaho eight man prep cast, but this doesn't apply specifically to eight man programs. Yeah. This is something that happens all yeah. the way up to the top of the, the very biggest schools in the state. So uh, we'll maybe we'll circle back and revisit that conversation a little bit later on down the road. Let's pull up this week's media polls. Will I I'm really interested in your opinion on this um, because there aren't, t- you know, the media poll is, you know, a guy from Coeur d'Alene and a guy from Boise and a guy from, it's kind of one person per region. Whereas, you kind of look at it from a bird's eye view, like I do. You look at the whole state and, and know quite a bit about the teams from every region. But if we look at the 1A Division One poll, and again, on, on the video version of this prep cast, we've got it up on the screen so you can follow along. But the 1A Division One poll, Oakley is one, Prairie is two, Raft River is three, Notice is four, Butte County is five. And that's the exact same as it was last week. But what, what are your thoughts on that top five for the 1A D1, Will? I think that that's probably as good as it can be realistically. I mean, you look at that that top three, Oakley, Prairie, Raft River, those are your blue bloods. Those are your teams that more often than not are going to be in the conversation. Um, and they've, to this point this year, they've looked good doing what they've needed to do. Yeah. Um, notice, I think, and Butte County for that fact, both of those teams, those are both programs that I think people should have an eye on. Those are teams that could um, do some damage when we get to November. You know, Butte County, Coach Thorngren, and he's always got 800 running backs capable of just yeah. torching anybody on a moment's notice. And and speaking of notice, the Pirates, um, Coach Woodland has basically everybody back from last year's team that was undefeated going into the playoffs. Carter Woodland, you know, uh, you just go up and down the list. They've got a lot of kids there. So you look at that top five, I think that that is an accurate depiction. I think the voters pretty much nailed that. I think there are some other teams that will play themselves into the conversation at some point, but I would, I would feel pretty confident as we sit here now in the, you know, early stages of September that the, the team that gets the banner at the, at the end of the season is one of those five teams right there. Most, most likely. Yeah, and Butte County, I just looked up their schedule. They've got a, a trifecta of the next uh, three weeks. Rockland, Raft River, Dietrich. That, that's their next three games. And, and we're going to be we're going to be at Butte County for that Dietrich game. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. But yeah, Rockland, Raft River, Dietrich, then Chalice and Grace. And Chalice is no slouch either. And neither is Grace. So Butte County, a very tough, tough schedule the next uh, couple, three weeks. That's That stay healthy mantra is really going to be in effect. Yes, yeah, very sure. much. Stop so by mentioned- tailgaters on your way through uh, Arco. <laughs> You're right. Way. By Coach Thorngren. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I hear the nachos are fantastic. I haven't had them yet, but I've heard they are phenomenal. <laughs> I, I've had a, I've had a burger or two there. It's it's actually a pretty fun place to go. That's nice. tailgaters in Arco. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. Notice uh, we mentioned fifty four to twelve over Council. That's one of those teams we talked about. Everybody's got a stud, but they've got a couple. Right? They didn't have Clemens, their quarterback, in this past game. That they started a freshman at quarterback, and you know. They had they still had Carter Woodland to to lean on, and so they look good. I'll tell you, my top five has not changed at all from the preseason to now, and my top five has looked a little bit different. I came into the season with Raft River as my number one team. I based that upon the players they had coming back. Oakley lost more to graduation than Raft River did, in my opinion, and I thought the players that Raft River did lose, they had capable replacements, especially at running back when you talk about Thane Lowe Miller replacing Ethan Bernard. So I, I've had Raft River number one all season. You see that one in parentheses, that first place vote? That's me. That's, <laughs> I've, got, I've done that three weeks now. I've had Prairie number two, and I've had Oakley number three. When it comes to the polls, 
I'm not one of these people that says, oh, well, you're the defending champ. You're automatically number one. I don't buy into that. I look at it as Oakley did lose a lot. They do have some good players coming back, but they really struggled against Lapway in that first game of the year. They had a nice win over Grace last week. But to me, Oakley, just based on what I've seen, is the third best team behind Prairie and Raft River. And it's a tight race, and maybe Oakley beats Raft River later in the year, and I look dumb. But for now, I really do think Raft River is the best team. And I've had notice at four and Butte County at five all year. Everyone had Lighthouse Christian in the, in the preseason top five. I went with Butte County, and I haven't changed them from that spot. And I'm glad finally that – uh, you know, part of it is Lighthouse dropping to 0-2 with two very tough games, but I'm glad that people are finally recognizing that Butte County's got a really good team this year. So It's hard for, uh, especially in the eight-man game, and this is part of why I got into the, the Idaho eight-man thing, is um, as media coverage has, has dropped due to the cut of resources and the cut of bodies, where you see it a lot is in the smaller classifications. So you know, outside of coaches, the coaches know and the coaches talk. Um, you may not know a whole lot about Butte County, even though they're traditionally a very solid team, but last year was such a, a lost year for them um, with the COVID issues and the schedule issues and whatnot. Um, you know, it was, it was so I think that a lot of people, you know, a, a writer in North Idaho doesn't know much about them until yeah. mid-season. Um, and that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. That's just the reality of, of the situation here and just the expansive geography of the state. So, you know, Brandon, I think you're top five. I mean, I don't, I can't really argue in terms of, yeah. you know, the, who those one, two and three are. I just think that in my mind right now, those are the three best teams. Could a Lapway sneak in? Could a Kamii sneak in? Uh, could a, a, a Wilder sneak in? Yeah, potentially. Uh, and that's that's the joy of getting out on the field is we'll get to see it we'll get to see it firsthand. Yeah, yeah. for sure. The one A D two poll looks like this: Carry number one for the third consecutive week. Dietrich number two. Kendrick is third. Horseshoe Bend fourth. And Rockland, your Rockland Bulldogs, will sneaking in there at number five. All of those teams are two and zero. Oh. And uh, the poll stayed the exact same, except for that number five slot. Um, North Gem got swapped out for Rockland following their loss to Kerry. So what are your thoughts on that 1A D2 poll? Again, top three, I think. I mean, I think Kerry is the presumptive number one. They're the they're on top of the jungle gym till someone knocks them off. And that's not just this year. That's a program that over 20 years has done something that, you know, I'd put them up there with in terms of, contextually within their conference, I'd put them right up there with, you know, Eagle Highland, Rocky mountain Coeur d'Alene, as far as dominance yeah. um, within their program. I mean, you look at their roster and it's like, you know, are, are there any boys in the stands cheering on the games? Or are they all in uniform right now? Yeah. Because, you know, they've got more kids in their eight man program than some three, a teams do. It's really, really impressive, but yeah, you get down to the four and five. I think horseshoe bend is a team that, um, I really like their their offensive weapons. I really like their tools. Uh, I think uh, Coach Elliott would like to see the defense continue to progress, and I think it will. Uh, and I think that they'll be a factor. And like I said, Rockland and North Gem, I think either one of those teams, and, and lump them in with Mullen St. Regis. I am a big, big fan of, of what they have going on up there. I mean, how many other programs below like a, you know the 5A programs I just mentioned uh, can say that they've had kids recruited and, and you know, accepted offers to go play college football. Um, you know, Sky Galloway two years ago, Riley Trogdon last year. You got Adam Ball and Luke Trogdon this year, Caleb Ball next year. I mean, you could be talking four straight years, maybe more, that Mullen St. Regis puts kids onto a college program. And I, I think, again, I think there are a lot of 3A and 4A teams that would love to be able to do that, let alone a 1A team. So, I think there's a little more unknown in the D2. I think there are a few other teams. I think a Castle Ford could make a run, a team that's receiving votes. Um, I think there are other teams that could do a little bit of damage um, if the path opens up for them, if they stay healthy and they, you know, the ball bounces their way. I think that there there are some upsets that could happen there. But I, I mean, I just think Lane Kirkland and what he has going there at Cary, man, they are they're they're just they're going to be tough to beat, man. That they did. 
I don't know how they do it. Whatever they're doing, they need to bottle it and sell it. I think you could. I think you could take four or five, and and those three receiving votes and put them all in a Yahtzee cup, shake it up, dump it out, and and you'd be right. Uh, no matter what order you put those in, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a fan of a team dropping out of the top five because they got beat by the number one team. <laughs> you know, it's hey, you lost to carry you're out, you know, right. the bar is set a little high for you there, if that's the case. But yeah, I, I like this. I, I like the parody um, in, in the 1A D1 and 1A D2 this year, where you, you kind of look up and down and go, yeah, yeah, that, that team could come out at the end of the season. Oh, yep. That team could, instead of having that, that one team that everybody looks at and it's a foregone conclusion, everybody's playing for second place. Uh, I, I like how it is uh, with, with so many good teams around the state. You've got North Idaho. You've got here in the Treasure Valley. You've got the Magic Valley and, and, and Eastern Idaho. You've got teams from all those areas that could potentially come away with a blue trophy in November, and that makes the season that much more fun. Yeah, I think what really stood out in that North Jam Carey game is is that maybe the gap between Carey and everyone else isn't as wide as we thought coming into the season, and maybe yeah. somebody might challenge them. The top five for me, uh, I had Carrie one. I've had that all season. Uh, Kendrick number two, and that's been my number two uh, all season long so far. I will admit I was a little low on Dietrich. They weren't in my preseason top five. But, Will, I was basing that on the preseason coaches poll that we received from the coaches in their league where they would mm -hmm. pick to finish third in their preseason coaches poll behind Castle Ford and carry so in good conscience i couldn't put a team that was picked to finish third in this conference even though it's a good conference i couldn't put them into my top five so I, I didn't have dietrich in there i think they are better than a lot of people thought coming into the season and now since that week one victory i've had them squarely at number three on a pretty consistent basis behind kendrick and carry horseshoe ben's been number four for me all season and, and up until this week i had north gem as my fifth ranked team they weren't in the initial preseason top five but they were put in after the first week um and then i had to drop them after the loss this week i had to drop mullen saint regis to make room for dietrich that that's what was really <laughs> tough for me i had i had i had mullen as number four in my preseason poll but then because dietrich won and mullen hadn't actually played a game yet you know, I had to move. I had to move Mullen out. They didn't play until last week was their first game, and now that they've lost, it's really hard for me to put them in the top five. But I still think when the season's over, they're definitely yeah. going to be a top five team and probably a Final Four team. So, so I did swap out North Gym in that fifth spot this week, and I put uh, I put Castle Ford personally in at, at number five uh, based on their two and zero start and based on the preseason coaches poll in that conference. People seem to be high on Castle Ford. They're kind of one of those mystery teams, but so far the results are, are speaking for themselves. Yeah, they've definitely got some talent. And and that's the thing is that that division, um, you know, Camas County, maybe they bubble up on a given year, you know, just go up and down the list. Hanson went into the playoffs last year um, and, you know, they had a nice season last year. But when you when you start with Kerry and Dietrich, you talk about it's hard to have three teams in the top five. That's the type of that's the type of conference that's going to have three teams in the top five is a team that has, um, you know, Batman and Robin at, you know, number one and number two. And then, you know, is Mayor West or whoever, who's going to be the number three, I guess. But, um, you know, you talk about Mullen St. Regis and, and to a degree, I think you could argue this with North Gem and Rockland too. The power in D2 for so long, basically ever since there's been a D2 has been district two, district four. You've yep. got the population base is District 3, so everybody knows the long pins. You get up into District 1, Mullen St. Regis has played one game, and it's against a team from Montana. We don't always get to hear as much about them because they just they don't get that much attention up there. So I think it'll be really easy for Coach Spooner to sort of fly under the radar, and as long as they can stay healthy and as long as they can take care of business, come into those 1A Division II playoffs and – maybe catch a team or two by surprise because they don't know as much about Mullen St. Regis. Yeah. Uh, but I think the fact that the Tigers won a playoff game last year and then went down to Dietrich and kind of got a taste, uh, I think it'll be a little bit harder for them to do with coaches. I think coaches are aware, but you know, John Q person sitting at the Perkins down in Burley, um, <laughs> or was it a Denny's? Was it a Perkins or was it a Denny's? It was Perkins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They may not know as much because they don't see as much District 1, District 5, District 6. 
in terms of the eight man game. Well, hopefully yeah. this eight man prep cast is bringing those fans from those different regions yeah. together. That's kind of the idea to kind of give them the cumulative overview of where things stand. And so uh, I think this has been a great discussion this week. Will. it's been really fun having you on. Let's wrap up with a look ahead to what's coming up this weekend. I got to be honest. This is like this is like a murderer's row of matchups there. Isn't I mean, it? I don't I don't even know where to start. There are so many great matchups. Let, let's all pick one. Will I'll let you have the first uh pick here in the draft which which game do you want to talk about kendrick oakley um you know that's one i know paul it's on your radar um but uh you know oakley is the number one team in division one kendrick's number three in division two and no one has ever questioned the skill of kendrick they've had as much skill as anybody it's it's usually been a depth issue for them if they get a key injury or two um, they can get into a little bit of trouble. And, uh, I, you know, Zane Hobart does a really good job up there coaching. He has good kids. They work hard. They play hard. I don't think they need to win the game to prove anything. Uh, I think what will open a lot of eyes around the state is people opening up their their Sunday paper and seeing, oh, man, Oakley only beat them, you know, 42 to 32 or something like that, something like that. Um, yeah. I think if Kendrick can just trade punches, I think they will earn a ton of respect statewide. Yeah, that, that was my game, too. In fact, Will and I are going to be broadcasting that game. They're going to meet in Parma, which is always cool. I love those games where they meet in the middle. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to do. So, we'll, you know, if you're, uh, if you're an eight-man football fan, two o'clock mountain time, tune in, idosports.com. We'll, we'll be there doing that game. Uh, but, you know, you look up north um, since Will took mine. You know, Prairie, Clearwater Valley. You know, Prairie, obviously good. Again, we watch them. We watch Clearwater Valley. Um, you know, Clearwater Valley does have a little bit to prove. Um, you know, they they look to be better this year. Um, and and so I think that'll be a good bellwether game uh, for them. Uh, and then Wilder Carey. I mean, those are my two. Um, and, and we're going to have that broadcast as well. Logan's going to be at that one this Friday um, with Carey coming over to Wilder. And, and I think that's one of those where – uh, Coach Del Solio has to tell his kids, people are going to be watching this game, not just on Idaho sports, but in general saying, okay, how good is, how good is Wilder? And it, and it's kind of like what you said, Will, they don't need to beat them, but they need to put up a fight and, and they need to show that, that they came to play and that they were able to make stops. And if they can do that, uh, then, then people will walk away with, with, you know, a little more respect maybe than they had prior to the game. So those three games that are, those are the ones on my radar this weekend. Yeah. And I think, you know, to, to circle back, I think Wilder, I think Wilder can trade punches and, you know, mm-hmm. maybe a, get a couple breaks and steal a win. Same with Kendrick. I think that they've got enough talent to give Oakley all they can handle yeah. and, and then some and uh, Clearwater Valley. I think they've um, they it's, it's a tall order for coach Hutchins and his team. Um, they've got to find a little more offense than we saw in the eight man classic. But the thing yeah. is, I think they've got the players. They just need to execute better. Yeah, and so again, a reminder, uh, on the broadcast schedule, uh, live video broadcasts Friday and Saturday of eight-man action here on IdahoSports.com. Friday night, Kerry 2-0, and traveling to Wilder, a 1-1 and squad. That game will kick off at 7 o'clock Friday night, and then Saturday afternoon in Parma, it is Kendrick meeting up against Oakley, a pair of 2-0 and teams at a neutral site contest Saturday 2 p.m. the kickoff there, both on IdahoSports.com. Paul, I'm really glad you can follow directions. I said everybody pick one game to talk about. So now, now he you picked talk, mine. You did two. You picked two. You did Prairie Clearwater Valley, and you did Wilder Carey. Now what am I, mean, I supposed to talk? Now about? you got to pick a rando, Brandon. You got to pick some <laughs> random game. Well, I'll tell you, Rockland Butte County. I could have talked about. <laughs> Would you just? <laughs> That's exactly where I was going to go. Butte County is 2-0. and <laughs> Rockland is 2-0. and Both ranked yeah. fifth in their respective polls. I, I like Butte County there. Um, yeah. Personally, they are the larger school, of course. So I think that's going to be a fantastic matchup. Um, I'm really excited up north as well to see Kamii. That's a team that hasn't even played yet. They were supposed to play last week. Their game got wiped out because of uh, COVID-19 problems. So they'll be making their season debut against Logos, which... Um, had a nice opening 
win in the first varsity yeah. game in program history. And then maybe we're kind of brought back down a little bit playing Genesee last week, which is going to be a good team up north. But it'll be fun to chart Logos and how they do in their first varsity season. And Kamii could be one of those sneaky teams. We just don't know yet. We haven't seen them. So, yep. yeah. Uh, and by the and way, you, you just picked two games as well. So, well, you because you, own. you blew so up. I'm the, the only one. Hang on. I'm, I need to pick a second game. Hang on. Hang on. Because <laughs> I feel like you guys, I feel like I've got to add a second one here. Hang yeah. on. I'm going to scroll. And the first one I see, uh, I'm really looking forward to that Shoshone Glens Ferry JV game. Are you really? I am. And, and I believe that's probably a Shoshone JV as well. We're, we're, we're looking into that to see. Uh, yeah. Because it's currently on the on. schedule three times. So obviously it's that important. Yeah. Um, I noticed that as well. Yeah, yeah. Coach Perry, He, I talked to the Shoshone head coach, and uh, he's he's pretty optimistic of the group he has. They're just uh, – they're still trying to, uh, you know, get numbers and get depth to where they can go back full as a as a Division One varsity team. But um, you know, they've they've got some players. They'll win a couple of games this year. I don't have any doubt of that. I think one game uh, that we didn't touch on yet, though, and probably the last like really big gargantuan game, I think, is going to be Dietrich at Castleford. We'll we'll, fi- we'll find out real quick, Will, who who uh, is second best behind Kerry. Right? For sure, and and that's the thing that's great about those types of games is those get settled on the field. The the cliche is what it is, but you know people want to believe, they want to buy in on Castle Ford. Okay, here's your chance. You know, here's your chance. They're going to roll the ball out there, and one team's going to kick it off to another, and then we're going to play. And uh, I think that they've certainly got the ability to to come out of that game with a win. But boy, Dietrich's Dietrich's a good team. They're they're explosive. They've got some players. Yeah, we'll find out for sure. Maybe a little separation this week as we get some really big matchups mm-hmm. on the schedule. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, uh, we went a little long today on the Idaho 8-Man Prep Cast, but uh, good conversation. And, Will, it was awesome to have you on board. We'd love to yeah. check in with you in a couple more weeks and see how things have changed and, and pick your brain again because uh, you, are, you are a cornucopia of information when it comes to 8-Man football. I don't even know what cornucopia means, but uh, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I could have called you a lot worse. Let's just say that. Paul you're just a, you're just a big cornucopia, Will Haneke. <laughs> yeah. And remember, if you want to if you want to follow Will, his eight man account is uh at Idaho Eight Man on Twitter. Um it's kind of a big reveal party, I think, right here. It's kind of nice. I that that's what's funny is I've never I've never hidden from it, but I've never really I didn't know it was you for a year either. and a half. You didn't? I had no clue. And then one day we're talking about it. You're like, yeah, that's me. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. I, all right. Great. Forgot all, I didn't realize that. No, it's, yeah. it's not something I, I, it's not something I hide from, but it's also not something that I'm doing for attention or profit either. Like I said, the idea is, you know, if I can, if I can help some of these kids, you know, get a little bit of positive yeah. feedback, a little bit of positive attention, that's, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. So get, definitely give that a follow because there, there is no better, resource for eight man not just football but athletics as well uh than the uh, eight man account on twitter so all right that'll wrap it up for this edition of the idaho eight man prep cast again you can get the audio uh wherever you download your podcasts also at idahosports.com video if you want to see uh us having fun uh, on on the video chat today yeah. you can uh get that at the idahosports.com youtube channel as well as our facebook page so uh, enjoy the weekend of games everybody and we'll have plenty to talk about again next week as always for paul kingsbury and our guest will henneke i'm brandon bainey thanks for tuning in to the idaho eight man prep cast from idahosports.com <laughs>